Excellent. All right, so I think you heard my intro this morning. There, as I promised, there would not be hot tub time machines or the Enterprise, but there will be references and, and fun humor like that. Uh, so very briefly, I'm Dylan. I'm from the US. I lived in London for a couple of years, and I know Tony because he speaks at Halfstack, which is a conference I run in London every year. Um, which is a UI-centric JavaScript conference in a shortage pub. Um, this year will be on November 22nd. The tickets are affordable and it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm also involved in a number of open source projects. I started Dojo back in 2004. I started SitePen back in 2000. SitePen is a JavaScript consulting company with about 40 people on our team. We all work remote. We've been remote since 2007. We also, uh, there is a whole new wave of people coming in. So. Sorry. That's all. So, Four lucky people who ask the best questions at the end will win their very own copy of Milestone Mayhem, which is a card game we created about the ups and downs of software development. So we'll cover that near the end as well. And then um, uh, that's, that's the intro. So that's what I do. I, I run SitePen and I run Dojo. So for me, to, the best way to predict the future is to look at the past and look at sci-fi and sort of look at how things go. I've given a talk like this for the better part of 20 years, but I don't give it very often, so it's always creative and fun and interesting for me to do. So of course, hearing that the conference was called Future Sync, I figured this might be a good talk. So what I hope to illustrate with you today is what makes the web the web, why does that matter, what is it that's so powerful about it, and where do I expect it to go in the near future? There are some seats in the front two rows for the stragglers who got let out late from their last talk. Everyone else is just going to have to stand probably. So there you go. All right. So what is the web? I like to describe the web as a universal application engine. And what I mean by that is if you can write a software application, maybe you can't do it on the web at first, but eventually you should be able to do that. You should be able to deploy software to the web. It shouldn't take any effort to install it, of course. And so it's the like, minimal barrier to entry to get someone using a product or service they're trying to create. And the reason I describe it as a universal application engine is, well, obviously the Star Trek reference for universe. Um, but more, more importantly, it should be able to run any type of application. And it's kind of that lowest common denominator executable where you can push anything at it and then end up with something that you can run inside of it. So that's why the web is so important and beloved to me. The web itself is that engine, but it's also comprised of a series of open source technologies and features that is growing at a rate faster than anyone can keep in their head at once, which is good and scary. Um, but it started out with HTML and CSS and later JavaScript and then media files and vector graphics and um, virtual reality and augmented reality and web sockets and protocols and storage and so on. That's great, right? We use what we need. We don't use the things we don't need. I mean, I could build an application that uses every web, te web technology ever conceived, but that would not be a great reference example to follow. But the browser itself is the sort of shell that supports all of these technologies. And it might not support all of them, but it gives us this baseline platform that meets a certain set of standards that allows us to deploy applications to the world. So that's pretty simple, right? Uh, but the definition of the web is kind of blurred over the years, right? So there's these technologies we use and rely on to create software, and there's this browser engine where we can run things, but there are also other environments that can take web technologies and convert them to native technologies, or that can take web technologies and run them as web technologies inside of native technologies. So this full spectrum of like 100% pure web to 100% pure native, and everything in between. And I think that that's great. Some people think that's not the web. That's, it has to be like view sourceable in a browser, nothing else is the web. And I don't uh, prescribe to that definition because I think that would limit what we can do with the technologies we learn. And the reason the web is so powerful to me is I can learn a relatively small number of languages and technologies and build software that can do almost anything. So the web is also how we deliver content and applications. So I had this lengthy debate with the guys who uh, do the mob programming to give the first tech talk today last night. And they were increasingly getting less coherent as they were drinking more last <laughs> night. And I had the privilege of drinking water, so I was on top of my game. And basically, they were, they were you know, making comments like, why the web? It's terrible. I want silver light. I'm like, 
Okay, clearly you're either trolling me or you've had a few too many beers. But, <laughs> but like, the web started out as content, right? We had HTML, which is hypertext markup language for documents, which comes from SGML before it. We have CSS, which was originally designed as a print styling, you know, a bunch of rules that were sort of based on like how you print documents, how you do PDFs, things like that. And it's evolved into this thing where it's a, the HTML and CSS are kind of a snapshot viewpoint of a dynamic application with content and information in a particular state at a particular moment in time. So some people say, well, the web's not adequate for building complex software. Well, clearly it is, because otherwise we wouldn't have the frameworks we have and, and the support that we do. But conversely, the web is really good at that snapshot view of content that needs to be rendered on the screen. And the web really has no official opinion on how you structure your application to get that snapshot displayed. And I think that's both empowering and frightening for most people. So lots of benefits of the web. You can do pretty much any kind of user experience you can imagine. Yes, there are some things where a native application today might be better. But I would argue that over time, those differences get diminished or eliminated. And we see like 10 or 20 years ago on the web, the differences and the time it would take for a new technology to be web enabled was years. Like the time it took from the SVG standard being proposed to all browsers supporting SVG graphics was somewhere in the order of 10 years, which is horribly long. And then when WebVR came out, implementations for that in browsers were out within a year or two. So the time it's taking the web to catch up with something that's sort of proprietary or non-web in the short term is greatly diminished. So the web is able to iterate faster and keep up with technology. We've seen a lot of talks about connecting data. Um, and there are the beauty of the web also is it's sort of an engine where we can just plug data into it from any arbitrary source. As long as we can get it in a JSON API or some other API that's accessible, we can plug that data into an application and show that information in a useful way. And really, that's all software is. It's give me the information I need in a context and an experience that is relevant to what I'm doing and make me as efficient as possible. Right? And if you don't have that mindset when you're creating software, why are you creating something? Right? Okay, like something could be pure entertainment or pure fun, but like you're trying to help users achieve a goal as efficiently as possible. And so a lot of the things we do sort of forget that or lose sight of that. So big benefit of development. Uh, so we have this sort of common set of standards that we use across different platforms. So one of the reasons React Native became popular isn't because it's the best way to create native applications. It lets a whole class of users who write JavaScript or TypeScript using React then apply the same reactive architectures and principles to creating native applications. And that's powerful, right? Because that means I can like learn a little bit more and now target a whole new platform rather than having to go learn how to write Objective-C code or Swift code, go learn how to write Kotlin or Java code for Android and so on. This picture looks pretty much like I looked when I was four or five years old, but it's not me. It could also be my son. But you know, this, the marketing slogan from Sun Microsystems for anyone who remembers was write once, run everywhere. Except that never really worked or never happened. So it was like this mythical marketing slogan. So I would argue the web is right once run anywhere-ish. Because it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of adjustment to support more and more platforms or more and more environments. But fundamentally, you're learning the same core set of technologies and then extending that knowledge a little bit to do different things with it. So well-architected apps, you know, you could argue, basically share code across target environments. So a good application isn't storing knowledge about the particular browser you're in or the particular differences you're in in every part of your code base. So like the beauty of React or Dojo or Angular or Vue or whatever is that most of the time you're just writing code following a set of principles or architecture patterns. And then those differences are kind of buried away in a few select places. Anyone who's ever tried to ship controversial software to the App Store in the audience? Anyone ever been rejected by the App Store? OK. That's really fun, right? Because uh, it's kind of an opaque process. Obviously, the web doesn't get in the way of that unless your country blocks your domain for some reason. But um, obviously, you've got other problems in that case. Uh, but the, you know, the beauty of the web is here's the URL. You can go hit it. And then for some reason along the way, we got lost and said, people can't type. Let's just make them install an application. 
which is cool until you run out of space on your phone and you can't fit any more applications on your screen. And you're like, what was that app? And you go to install it again. And you're like, oh, I already have that one. That's so crazy. <laughs> so, so there's this concept of like nothing to install. Like you just open a web browser. And that's beautiful, right? Because it's already there. Every web user, every internet user with any device has a web browser by default. So there's, you know, of the 100% of users of the internet, they all have a web browser available. Unless they're like on a super old feature phone that you couldn't install an application on anyway. But the first application on any mobile device is browser. So works on every platform virtually. Um, I threw IoT in there because, you know, it, it makes sense, right? But like the ability to basically target these engines is really, really powerful and flexible. And having links and URLs is key to doing what we do. Now, for a while, JavaScript tried to break the concept of linking by basically making single page applications that weren't referenceable or bookmarkable or things like that. But for the most part, we fixed those problems by adding routing, or as you say in the UK, routing, um, and other, other techniques to make sure that we can actually share a reference to a particular state in an application, not just the landing page, but then I have to go through 10 steps to get to see the same thing that you're seeing as a person. It's easy to update. I mean, especially with um, services like AWS, where you can sort of spin down instances and then roll up instances and um, what's it called? Um, hydrate and rehydrate the instances so that basically you can auto update an application without any users ever experiencing any downtime if you're careful and efficient. But you know, obviously there's some techniques to learn, like how to set caching and how to do updates like that. But compared to saying, all right, push us to the app store, wait a couple weeks, and then it'll hopefully be live, and then hopefully people will update, and kind of waiting for that, the web is just instantly updated as soon as you push. So beyond the browser, there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, web technologies are taking over the web. I told this joke a few days ago um, at one of the meetups, so some of you may have heard this. but. So I was a JavaScript developer starting in 96, which is pretty much when JavaScript came out. It came out in 95. And for the first eight years of my career, people would say one of two things when I told them I was a JavaScript engineer. One, they would say, oh, you mean Java. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean yeah, I'm Mrs. Hamburger, right? I mean JavaScript. And then the follow-up would be, well, why would you do that? Why not just learn Java? Obviously, it's because I don't, I don't like that model. I want to put stuff on the web. I don't want to write applets. I want to write code that works in a browser. And so about seven or eight years ago, JavaScript over to Java to the point where, I think this is from GitHub, Java doesn't even have a memory of like being the number one technology, which is great. <laughs> so I was at a meetup last year, and it was a JavaScript meetup, and this guy was telling this fairly junior engineer that he wrote Java code, and the kid's like, Oh, Java, is that like JavaScript? <laughs> yes, we've won. Finally <laughs> accelerated Java and taken over the web, right? But if you look at that list, you'll see that Python and PHP are primarily used as backends for web technologies. TypeScript is rapidly accelerating and is probably my favorite variant of JavaScript today. And um, so, really, most of the popular programming languages today allow you to do something with the web. Now, this list actually removed HTML and CSS from it. Their old server used to have HTML and CSS, which were also in the top 10, and I think they still are. So if you think about that, that would push Ruby and C off the list. And so you would have HTML, CSS, TypeScript, PHP, Python, and JavaScript, which were all primarily <coughs> languages used to power the web. So that would be seven out of the 10 most popular languages used today. So how many of you have used Electron? A few, almost half maybe. Uh, so Electron is a really powerful environment that gives you Chromium and V8 and basically lets you write desktop applications using web technologies that people can install. And that's really useful. If, how many of you use VS Code or Atom as an editor? Okay, almost everyone. So those are both Electron apps. They're using web, te web technologies embedded in an application. And the reason it's provided as a downloadable application is because you're doing a lot of file system access and you're using a lot of resources. So it's nice to have a separate container and shell that can manage all of that. You also need a bit more permissions than you would typically get with a web browser because you're saving files to your local file system. But beyond that, there's really nothing about those environments that are specific to the desktop. They're almost all web technologies. So then there are services like Code Sandbox that take that IE experience and put it into a browser, and it feels nearly as fast and efficient as a local copy of VS Code. There are a lot of solutions that let you compile from native web into 
uh, or sorry, from web into native code. Um, I'll just not say much about that. So, <laughs> all right, that's kind of the state of where we are today. Like, those are the technologies we have. Those are the benefits that we have. We have 45 minutes, so maybe. Yeah, sorry. The wrong time. Cut yeah, me off. Yeah. Right. I'm like, that was a really fast 40 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> all right, so. I love Back to the Future because it's mostly a movie about the future, but it's almost all in the past, right? That's kind of the gist of this talk until we get to the interesting stuff. But so looking back at the history of the web, Ruby talked about this very early on in her talk. She talked about Tim Berners-Lee and the start of the web and whatnot. But you know, it, basically the idea behind the web was this revolutionary idea of distributing information from multiple locations across the world. And that's kind of cool and kind of nice, and that's what the internet's about. And so, what led to the web? Well, obviously, everyone's heard the story of Sir Tim Berners, Tim Berners Lee, TBL. Yeah, it's tongue twister sometimes. But so he wrote this proposal called Information Management: A Proposal. And if you has everyone seen this before? Okay, only a few. So if you look at the very top. The feedback from his advisor was <laughs> vague but exciting. And that has to be the most understated comment ever to the most transformative technology of our time, right? So the next time you think you're doing something amazing and your colleague or your boss says, oh, that's kind of vague but exciting, just know that you're probably on to something really great and really amazing. So kind of ignore your critics and follow your path. But so some of the early goals were to basically make a decentralized environment that's neutral, non-discriminatory, has just lots of things that are based on consensus and not having a single vendor control the environment. And that's really powerful and useful. So the web, pretty much since it was invented, has been under attack or in a battle or a war. And not just with itself and browsers and frameworks, but I'm talking about things that threaten the stability of the web. So the first battle was kind of when the web displaced a lot of software development at the time. Because before the web, all applications were desktop applications because there was no web to push them to. And so I like to because like Windows 95 shows you like all the horrible you know applications you would have that really did nothing, but they were all open all the time because that's what you need. Well, of course, couldn't have that many open, but it's a nice image, right? <laughs> uh, so that was kind of the first battle, and the realization was more and more the things that you created like a shareware application for or a downloadable application that had full file system access to like let you pick a color, right? Things like that probably weren't necessary as things you would give full control of your operating system over in order to run that application. And luckily, um, the pretty much the turning app, uh, the turning point for that was, well, okay, I don't have to install this. I don't have to go to share sites that are kind of scammy in their nature um, at the time, or I don't have to trust like download, like buy a CD with software or, or things like that. And so, really though, the, the beauty was that like, hey, we're able to do this stuff in a non-proprietary way, it's available on my system, but early on it was pretty much forms. And we had this sort of dumb client smart server environment. So the server would do a bunch of work, calculate the HTML, send it down the wire, you the user would have something, you could click a link, which then go back to the server, generate some new content, send it all back down the wire with a big splash of white or gray in between, or you'd have a form and you'd submit that. So Internet Explorer was kind of the turning point for that. When I say Internet Explorer 4, because Netscape 4 was established, but Internet Explorer 4 kind of brought JavaScript to the next level. They really pushed a lot of innovation at that point. So that was sort of battle number one. My animation seems a little bit off there, so. Battle number two was, well, okay. We've given up on the desktops. Now we're just going to put a plug in. It's going to give you a real programming environment in the browser because JavaScript's not a real language. So there was Flash, which included Flex, and then there was Silverlight, and there was Laszlo, and Java applets, and a few others. And plugins really failed for a few reasons, in my opinion. One, they're slower. Two, they didn't cooperate very efficiently with the web itself. And three, they were, they were prone to bugs and issues, and, and they were proprietary. So pretty much as soon as one plugin dominated like Java, everyone pretty much said, we're going to bring it down. Because the whole point of the web is it's no one company dominating or owning it. So let's make sure that no one kind of takes care of the world. So there were lots of limits, uh, but the plugins did things like accelerate features. So early on in Dojo's days, we used Flash to do audio because we couldn't play audio natively. 
So we would call to the Flash player to play an audio clip if that's what you wanted to do. But we knew that was a short-term solution to, to just wait out the web until it could update fast enough. But really, the, uh, the open versus proprietary thing is kind of the big deal there. So the turning point was kind of HTML5. HTML5 was this point where it said, all right, we're going to look at all the things that are missing with the web and give them to you so you can now use this universal application engine to replace plugins, which is great and cool. And it took about 10 years to finally to go from early idea to fully install across all browsers, which sounds like a long time, but at the time that was fast, which is kind of scary. Um, you'll notice some of these logos are old on purpose because they kind of like represent the point in time rather than now. So the real killer, though, was Apple. And Apple had really gotten angry with Adobe. And they said, we're not going to put a platform on our phone that's going to make it slow for users, which at the time was Flash, because Flash was quite bloated and large. And Android tried to put, um, later on, tried to put Flash on there, and it was terribly slow and awful. So um, it was great. It was great for me, because it was like the death of Flash was greatly accelerated by this thing in our pockets that we had never used before. So it made me very happy. In 2009, I gave a talk at a conference in New Zealand called Never Bet Against the Open Web. And the two sponsors, unbeknownst to me, were Microsoft and Adobe. <laughs> and my talk, it was a fairly boring conference at first. And the talks were really like vendor pitches by those two companies. And I was like, what did I get myself into? But I got to go to New Zealand, so it was cool. <laughs> so then I gave probably the most tirade living, I mean, laden uh, talk ever. Like, I mean, I just did all sorts of stuff against those two companies. And I got a standing ovation because people were like, finally, someone is willing to stand out and say, these are not the answer. The web is the answer. So uh, it was a kind of a nice turning point because they were there. And um, a guy from Adobe said, you know, you're, you're probably right. We're already looking to like move beyond Flash. And I was like, well, that's cool. That's great. But, um, so today, our biggest battle of the web is against native applications. And I say battle, but it doesn't really matter, right? But Native applications are often what people think of first, because they think of all the problems you might have with the web, or early versions of PhoneGap if you want to do a hybrid app, or they think the web isn't powerful enough even though it really is, or they think you can't install an app even though you can use a PWA, and so on. But really, there are lots of options to use web technologies. Whether you create a native application, or a PWA, or just a website, doesn't really matter. You can still use web technologies to create it, and the differences are diminishing regularly. So to me, um, I obviously prefer the web approach. I don't know why I must have messed up my animation. Sorry about that. Um, really, the turning point for me was iOS 9. At that point, that's kind of when they added their support for service workers for the first time, I think. And um, Chrome for Android, of course, as well, added the features we need. So there was a stat a couple of years ago. I don't know if this is still true, because I couldn't find a new study reporting this. But basically what they said was that well, there's a lot of fatigue around using native applications, because I don't want to install another application that I'm not going to look at. It's going to fill up my system. So mobile web usage is roughly double mobile app usage and growing was the stat that was reported. I don't know if I believe this with certainty, but it definitely mirrors my usage of my phone today. So the beauty of the web is as it finds new features, it adds them. Right? It doesn't add everything in the time scale you might want, but over a five or 10 year block of time, anything you can do natively today, you should be able to do on the web in short order. And that's really cool. So there's been a lot of progress over the years native vector graphics, shape detection, machine learning, speech recognition APIs and browsers, automate animations, audio, media key support. So a lot of these are just new standards. There's this group called the WICG, which is the Web Incubator Community Group. And they're doing all sorts of cool stuff that's kind of like JavaScript APIs for things that are missing on the web. Um, one of which was like intersection observers was a recent one that they did. There's web sockets or to see, so for networking in real time. So in 2007, um, my Dojo co-founder Alex Russell and I were invited to Apple's WWDC conference without knowing why we were invited. Like, why do they want to talk on JavaScript? I told this story at the speaker dinner, so if you're a speaker, just pretend like you didn't hear it. Um, <laughs> so we were, we were there, and um, Apple spends an obscene amount of time on your talk. Like, they probably spent 100 hours of their own time trying to make us look good, which is really difficult to do. Um, and so <laughs> then we, um, 
So we're getting ready to go to our talk, and there's this massive line, and we're like, wow, no one's going to come to our talk, because there's a line for what must be a great talk. And we get to the front of this like, four to 5,000 person line, and it's for us. <laughs> and uh, it turned out, like, at the first year, there was no native SDK, so they said, one more thing with the iPhone, if you want to learn how to program for it, go to this JavaScript talk. And it was just crazy. So we're like, all right, that's cool. But people were asking us, like, hey, is there battery support? Is there you know, features for all these APIs? We had no idea, because Apple didn't tell us anything, like they don't tell anyone <laughs> anything, right? And a lot of these things took five or 10 years to, to get right and get in place. But the things we have and the progress we're making, like the accessibility object model, uh, Ruby talked a lot about accessibility this morning. Dojo is the first JavaScript framework to support accessibility. We've been doing that for 15 years now, um, and it's very important to us. But it's always been a little bit difficult. But now you have this new standard called the Accessibility Object Model. It's kind of like the DOM object model, but for accessibility. So you can actually introspect what's being shown to a screen reader, rather than having to use a screen reader all the time. So it'll make it easier to test for accessibility and so on, um, which is really cool and, and really powerful. Lots of other good things. So just lots of consistency and patterns and reactive architectures. What you'll notice is a lot of the modern frameworks today on the surface look very similar because we have converged on patterns for how to write good software and use good architectures. The modern web UI has a lot of common trends. There's the flat responsive design. Does anyone know why that became trendy or popular? Any guesses? No? It's because it scales, right? So if you want to support everything from a screen this size to a screen this size, vector graphics and flat design scale. That's why you'll see all the airlines are redesigning the logo on the back of their plane, and suddenly they've gone from like really interesting designs to really flat, boring vector logos, because then they can reuse that design asset everywhere. So yeah, it looks good and it's efficient, but it's also something that scales across different sizes and dimensions. Slack published an article recently about how they had to redo their logo because it wasn't scaling for all the sizes they want to do. And it was a really interesting look, because it looked like their logo was scalable, but it actually wasn't. Lots of flexible architectures, lots of stuff deployed to the cloud. You know, the cloud is that great misnomer that we just acceptingly use after five years of saying it's not in the clouds. It's not on another computer. It's not serverless. There are still servers out there. They're just not mine, and I'm not having to manage them or think about them. There's lots of efforts around automation and bots and IoT and machine learning. I refuse to say the other word for machine learning because I think it's ridiculous. Um, but I'll probably say it in five years and just accept it. So, uh, Lots of nice work on ECMAScript and TypeScript. Those are kind of the things we use today, WebSockets, HTTP2, and kind of all the other things I said. This is probably the worst use ever of the internet, which is to put a screen on your refrigerator. You know, that's really going to be useful in three years when it breaks, then you can't use your refrigerator and have to like get a new one because your screen doesn't work and you, you can't control your, the temperature inside your refrigerator. But, but there's a lot of power from the, IO, the world of IoT. It's just the, the biggest fear I have with the IoT space is, is it sustainable? Because almost every IoT device requires a service on the back end. What happens if that company gets bored like Nest did with certain old APIs? Or what happens if that company goes out of business? Does your service work anymore? So that's kind of the, the biggest risk I see today with IoT. So in the near future, what's coming up? Well, we've seen a lot of it already. HTTP 3 is being proposed, and it's got a lot of nice things in it. WebRTC is already kind of taken off, but I think it'll become a much bigger thing that we use. <laughs> Speech recognition APIs are really cool because you know if you're driving down the road, you probably don't want to be texting on your phone. And we do that a lot in America because we drive with one hand. It's really scary, um, but we do it. And so just saying, I don't do it. I, but I use speech recognition. But if a lot of times, people, you know, you spend a lot of time in your cars in America, people do that sort of stuff. Uh, lots of machine learning stuff, the, the WICG stuff, etc. So there's also been a lot of interesting things ever since Pokemon Go came out. Um, obviously, that's like the best app ever for some people for like three months, and uh, it's really cool. There's a big move to sort of embrace reactive architectures. And people ask me, why didn't Dojo 1 do stuff reactively? And it sort of did, but not in the way we do today. And the reason is the amount of memory and the number of objects you have to put into memory to do a reactive application was too large for IE6 through 8, so it wasn't possible at the time. But what that means is we're finding that people are taking ideas that work in one framework and embracing them in other frameworks that have different opinions. So I work on Dojo, and modern Dojo is basically a TypeScript framework that's very lean and very efficient for creating modern applications. 
Um, it's focused primarily on the enterprise, but that's what it is. Um, but you'll see there's some of this trend chart. I wrote this chart, so I'm a little biased on it. Um, but there's lots of things that are emerging. Like this list is, I could make it 10 times as long. But what's interesting is the things over here that are kind of, you know, they're done basically, like jQuery, at least the current versions of jQuery. No one's using these things anymore because they're not allowing you to do all the new interesting things. They solve the problems of the past. Yeah, if you're creating a content site and you want to just put it up quickly and you know jQuery, like use it. No one's telling you you can't use it. But if you're trying to build a new modern application, no one really cares about that today. There's lots of bots. Um, I was talking with a guy recently who has only 10% hearing. And his biggest challenge of owning a home is talking to people to service his home. So he's using machine learning and bots to try to build a platform to like get your home fixed and serviced without ever having to talk to a person because he can't talk to people on the phone. So it's kind of um, back to the sort of accessibility point. The beauty of accessibility when done right is it makes things better for everyone. Do you really want to talk to a person on the phone when you can just text with them and get them out to your house? Right? You don't want to have to pick up a phone to get <laughs> something built. Like That's synchronous. That blocks you from doing your job. So the beauty of doing accessibility for the right reasons is it generally benefits everyone. The classic example is, um, what would you call them? You don't call them sidewalks, I don't know what you call them, but with the footpaths, right? So footpaths, okay. when you're walking along the road and you get to a street and you need to cross it, right? In the past, you had a, a curb. And then when the time came to make them accessible, they added little ramps so that wheelchairs could go across the street without having to like hop a curb and fall over, which would be bad and not accessible. Well, that's great, but then what did they enable? They enabled people with um, push buggies or strollers to walk their babies. They enabled people on bikes and scooters and other things like that. So that form of accessibility made things better for everyone. Similarly, on the web, keyboard shortcuts and high contrast mode and all of these other things we can do for accessibility make the web better for all of us, not just the people who actually need it. But, so the reason to do things the right way from an accessibility perspective is they will make your experience better for everyone, not just you know, the, the one to five percent of people who absolutely need that, that improvement. So we see a lot of improvements in automation. There's a lot of scare, um, a lot of just concern about if we automate everything, what will we do as humans? And no, no one has the answer to that. But I mean, it's still, there are a lot of things that are automated but not automated well, but that's certainly a trend that we're going to. But mostly we see a lot of applications really streamlined and simplified compared to 10 years ago to just make it simple to interact and respond to content as needed. I know some people who work for large <laughs> enterprises and like their entire Tuesday is dedicated to approvals. Like approving contracts, approving spending, like that sounds like the worst job ever, right? But years ago that meant they'd have to like sit at their desktop for eight hours and download stuff and review it all. But now they have little approval apps on their phone that just show them a little thing and they can just click yes to all of them and then they can go to golf or something right, the rest of the day. So, not really, but, <laughs> but the point is they're like streamlining their workflow around the process that they have to follow, which is kind of the whole point of software. There's a lot of intelligence being built into search. A lot of it is related to conversational, um, you know, natural language processing, things like that. And I say we're really early in the machine learning stages because We've been doing things related to machine learning and data science for like 30 years. It's just become really popular because it's become accessible. But I mean, the earliest versions of Google were using a form of machine learning to make search work well. It's just now we have APIs that are accessible to all of us to use on demand and create powerful interfaces based on that. We're all about trying to speed up the response time for things and that's really cool. A classic example, a quote from a few years ago was, mom saved her one-year-old's life while iPhone Siri calls for an ambulance, right? If people didn't believe in Siri or the power of speech then, they believe it now because the time it takes to just say, hey Siri, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, so now we're to the point of the talk. Uh, so that's, that's the background. That's where we are. That's where we're going in the near future. So based on all of that, what do we predict is coming next, right? And so, hopefully it's not this world, right? I intentionally removed the gun because I'm in the UK, right? But, <laughs> but that seemed a little wrong, so there we go. So.
Okay, she did. We could be in the Matrix. I mean, hopefully not, but we could be in that kind of world where, or it could be in a Borg world um, where all of our minds are collected. I mean, in many ways, the web and the uh, echo chambers we have at times feels like early signs of the Borg Collective from Star Trek, which is a bit scary. But back in a simpler time, when people could stand on the bridge and just talk like nothing's going on and say, hey, computer, like how far away are we? Like, I can't believe how slow the old Star Trek Next Generation is now. Because it's like the, they're going at like 1 100th the speed of how we are today. And it's very campy and very colloquial. And yet, almost everything they use on the Enterprise is stuff we can do today, with a few exceptions, like the warp engine and so on, right? So if we look at that, right? We have the communicator, which is basically a tablet or a phone, right? Cool. I mean, all the information you could get on a communicator in Star Trek in the in the '90s, well, obviously 300 years, you actually have today. So they got that completely wrong because their tablet should be way cooler than ours. You know, you could call a computer. That's speech recognition, right? It's hey, hey Siri instead of hey. <laughs> it's like, hey computer, right? But computer, how far are we to the Alpha Quadrant? Data. Data is basically a machine learning and a droid and a bot all in once. Now, big data is my favorite thing. I'll have to check something with him in a second. So we have the holodeck. That's basically augmented reality, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, we need to go a little bit further to get there. <laughs> but you can see the trajectory of where we're going with that. The Borg this is the web plus the cloud plus wearables. <laughs> <laughs> so when you meet people who like put a chip in their arm voluntarily, Seriously, you're like Borg 1.0. This is crazy. Yeah. So. The tricorder, health kit, or the Android equivalent, plus a watch, right? Because we're the first step on the path to that. Oops. <laughs> Spoil my big data surprises. <laughs> so, transporter and time travel, not quite there yet. But we do have time travel development now where we can rewind and go forward based on our development using things like. Um, uh, just uh, reactive architectures allow us to rewind and go forward in our development. Big data is my favorite. I don't know how many of you have seen this meme, but it's my favorite meme of all time. Because every time I hear someone say big data, I just look at this picture and laugh. And before machine learning and AI were the buzzwords, it's big data. All right, yeah, how tall is it? <laughs> so currently, some of our challenges are, like my company's worked remotely since 2007. So it's been 12 years we've all been working at home. And so we don't get a lot of human interaction with our team. So we get together every couple of years. We went to Cancun a few weeks ago and spent a week on the beach, which is really fun. But this is like from one of the Star Wars. I mean, it was one of the prequels, so no one watched it. Or like, everyone tries to forget it happened. But they did have some cool technology in there. Basically, like they had the meeting of all their people with the holograms in place, right? So one of the challenges of sitting there staring at your computer for an hour conference call or however long is like, you're worried about how you look. You have to focus on the screen to see people. You have to like think about your body language because it's different. Whereas if you were a hologram there and you felt like you were in the room with people, I think remote meetings would feel a lot more natural. Things are less mundane. I don't remember which movie this is from. Maybe Avatar, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but like the UI experience has become very minimalistic and very efficient. But some of the best conference talks I go to are where people like Ruth do really fun, amazing, interactive, immersive experiences, right? And so one of the challenges we have today is like processing information in a way that makes sense to our heads, especially when it's all in 2D. So adding a third dimension, making it where we can feel and experience. Um, yesterday, the speakers were invited to the, I don't remember the name, but the planetarium-like thing. And we had these really cool visualizations of like, how much CO2 this university gives off in a year, and it like flooded the whole campus, right? And then we had these Im immersive experiences of like how big the universe is, and so, but it was all 3D, and that's what made it really powerful and less mundane. We want to be able to make more intelligent decisions, so hopefully if people have information that's useful, they'll vote the right way, or they'll make the right choice, or they'll um, actually use their brains, and that's the hope, right? Now whether we're going down that path, who knows? But if you have useful information that actually helps you make a decision faster, that saves you time, it makes you more smart. Being able to get things done faster. I mean, no one wants to like do mundane work, I don't think. I mean, that's the whole point of automating things, especially for engineers. 
we will spend a whole day writing code to save us five minutes a day, right? And over time, that return on investment might not be good, but it makes us feel good. Right? It makes us feel like we are in control of our own environment. Collaboration is obviously becoming more and more important. We've seen like the mob programming trend. I mean, I don't know if that's something I would actually do because I'm kind of a solo developer when I get time to write code. Um, but collaboration is much more important than it was a generation ago when you do work because it's not possible to know everything in your head. And even if you have a computer, you might not remember what that thing is you're trying to remember or what it's called or how to use it. But if you have enough smart minds together or even enough decent minds together, you can together do something much greater. There's lots of work around uh, visualization and data analysis. And again, that goes back to like making things less mundane, more understandable, having the right information at the right time. So what's missing from this future? So this is Barclay. He had a neural interface. And then I was reminded Captain Janeway in Voyager, when she goes back in time to change the timeline, She's implanted with a neural device that lets her fly an aircraft or a spacecraft with her mind, right? So like to me, we've gone from like reading to typing to speech recognition to what's probably next is like mind recognition, right? Because you can think stuff faster than you can say it, which is faster than you can read it or type it. It's a little scary. There's this uh, developer, um, Charlie Girard, and she's been giving talks recently about mind-controlled UI. So there's these little devices you can put on your head called an emotive, and there's a few others. And they can basically read your different brain waves. If you have to train them a little bit. But you can train about two dozen commands today after you wear this device and use your mind to control things. So one of my former dojo uh, contributors has ALS, and he's starting to lose control of his body. But his mind is still really sharp. So today, he's using speech recognition. But he's concerned he's soon going to lose his ability to talk. But his mind will still be there. So he's working on using a device like this so he can communicate his thoughts more efficiently. Now, like everything, so I was like, this is my closer. And then I read an article with a quote from Zuckerberg a couple, month, a couple weeks ago, who is like, you know, everyone's mortal enemy right now because of privacy. So he was asked, what's, what's Facebook going to be like in 10 years? And he's like, well, of course. Mind control, right? <laughs> oh no, we're in trouble. And so the interviewer was like, "Well, what does that do about like Fifth Amendment rights? The, the U.S. like the you know right to not be incriminated against by yourself and whatnot." And so, really powerful potential there. Really difficult to do, but if done right and done securely, it could really change the way we're able to think and process things. Because I know I can think a lot faster than I can speak or type or communicate or or write. So it's really powerful to me. So. Why is the web wing? So a lot of these things I said are very general. They're very general technology things, right? But the web is this platform that's approachable, open, evolving, eases our distribution. I hate it when I do that. <sighs> Easy to distribute, universal, and full of features. Yeah, well, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's those things that are the essence of the web that says pretty much every interesting bit of technology should be powerful enough to be able to do through the web eventually. It might take some time, but that gives us this universal application engine to do all of these things. Now, I promised a few other things at the end, and I have like two minutes, so. Um, created this game called Milestone Mayhem. I have four copies of it to give away. They're for the best questions. I'm not the judge. She'll be the judge for the best questions. No pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, basically, it's a game that mimics sprint based development. And sometimes things go well, and sometimes they do not. And so the game is kind of like a, me a mix of blackjack meets press your dog. So hope you enjoy that, whoever wins it. Bring it to the after party if you want to play it. I'll show you how. Um, we also do a podcast called Talk Script. It is a less serious look at modern technologies, but we interview lots of great people. So when we go to JSConf, we interview the speakers. Um, we just had the maintainer of the web audio spec on there. Um, so we're about 30 or 40 episodes in, and it's just kind of a fun way that we look at tech and have fun with that. And so I work with SitePen. We do lots of sort of development and R&D for enterprise and open source applications. So we work with lots of big banks and technology companies, but also lots of small startups. Early in the day, we worked with Facebook. And uh, at one point, we trained 116 of their engineers on how to write JavaScript code. And that was interesting. So 
Um, at the time, they had no real core competency at JavaScript. And um, we also helped them make Facebook fast. So it's my fault. Not, not really, but, it's, <laughs> but I mean, we, we helped them like reduce their load time by like 90% because they were doing some things that weren't great. And it just goes to show that like even the best, most innovative companies sometimes struggle with things. And so we just try to help people out. So that's the gist. Hopefully, you're welcome and back to the future. Thanks. Way in the back. Now you get one. Pick well, <laughs> your best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your view on um, HTTP 2.0? HTTP 2.0? Um, so most people think it takes away all their problems of not having to bundle or minimize or split your code. But HTTP 2 would still ship all that code that you might not need to ship. So. It's really powerful in fixing the problems of like not having a persistent lightweight connection, but it doesn't solve the problem of like just shift the code to the wire that I need. Thank you. Do you still see a significant future of WebAssembly in moving away from native applications? Do I see a significant benefit of WebAssembly to move away from native applications? Yes, because there are certain. Th but WebAssembly is two things, right? One is the transpilation. And two is the process of not doing things in the main thread. The second one isn't unique to WebAssembly. It's just that's what's getting a lot of popularity. It's so much faster than JavaScript because it's not running in the main thread. But so are things that are done as web workers. But where I see its real benefit is things you've already written in other languages, like game engines. You don't want to rewrite that in JavaScript if you've got like the Unreal Engine. You want to port it into the browser and use it. So, there are certain things that are just not efficient to write in JavaScript, and it lets you bring them into the web. So I think it's very useful as a way to replace other native systems. We've got time for one more question. Oh, well, we need two more. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see a big explosion in, you know, you've got things like Wix and bits and pieces, where you know you don't have to know code to to build your sort of website. Can yes. you see some plug and play uh, for web apps coming on the screen? So what do I think of, so sort of two points there. For no-code platforms, I think no-code platforms are historically good at solving the easier half of the problem. So they're great for someone who has no technical experience to like create a basic application. But at some point, it becomes easier to write code and do configuration and do good architecture than it does to like press 100 different form fields to get something configured the way you want it to. So there's, they solve the easier half of the problems. But does it make the web more approachable to people? Absolutely, so that's the beauty of it. Last one, uh, Yes or no answer to this one, please. Will yes. the development of neural interfaces answer the uh, hard problem of consciousness as to whether or not it exists? Maybe. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.